Hey everyone, I hope you all are doing well during this uh, corona crisis. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about Dune, which is a classic that lots of people love. And I like it a lot as well. So I have been procrastinating on talking about this because I feel like um, it's such a classic that people have very strong feelings about. And it's a pretty, you know, it's a thick book. It's a lot of, a lot of content. Right, uh, the book is split into three sub books. I guess it's like book one, book two, book three, and it is a very ambitious book. So I, I did a thread on Twitter about it. Uh, the book was gifted to me by Mask of Icarus on Twitter. So thanks, thanks for the gift. And uh, you know, there's there's some twists, there's some intrigue. Uh, the characters are pretty easy to care about, and a thing that I pointed out was that. It feels like a platform. The book is like a platform for discussing many layers of many things. So, you know, there's the kind of like fundamental hero's journey story that the protagonist, Paul Atreides, Muad'Dib, goes through. And then, you know, there's it's it takes place on this desert planet called Arrakis. And uh, the, the, the book discusses the ecology of the planet, the, the, the politics of the characters... Um, kind of fighting over resources on the planet, I guess. And so, I've I've always heard Dune references in pop culture. You know, I'm familiar with like uh, the litany of fear. Right, fear is the mind killer. I will allow the fear to pass through me, and only I will remain. And um, what else? The spice must flow. Right, like that that phrase. And and sandworms. I think sandworms are a very a uh, powerful image that endured. You know, I remember in, in Mass Effect 2, the video game, when you go to Tuchanka, which is like a desert planet, there are these giant sandworms that you fight. And uh, that is definitely a reference to uh, Dune, right? For sure. And I'm, I'm sure there are many more references to Dune in pop culture everywhere that I may not have noticed before, but I have since started to notice when I see them, which is pretty cool. Um, you know, there's a bunch of cool quotes. It it does feel like um, you know, and I I think this is also true for the dispossessed, which is another book that I read since, and I'm going to review separately. Uh, that the book is almost is almost a vehicle for the author Frank Herbert, right, to discuss his. Well, I don't know for sure if they are his ideals, but he presents you know a bunch of philosophical ideas and and kind of uh frames for how to think about dealing with questions of, of leadership, questions of, of uh, how to conduct yourself and, and dealing with difficulty. And, you know, I, I, I can see pretty clearly how, like, um, if you read this book as a teenager, for example, which I think is when a lot of people read it, if you read it when you're pretty young and you haven't yet developed a kind of strong framework for how to make sense of things, uh, I can see how this book would imprint itself very strongly on you because um, you would see how characters are dealing with things. A thing that I said was, it's very gratifying to inhabit a, a fictional universe where the characters are very thoughtful about the challenges they face and the conflicts they deal with. It's almost unrealistic in the sense that... I mean, so obviously when you're talking about science fiction, it's not realistic in the sense that, oh, that you know, as far as we know, there's no such... Thing as a desert planet with people on it that we know of, right? So it's in that sense, it's not realistic. But it's also interesting because practically all of the characters are just very, very thoughtful. And I remember this being true as well for the Ender's Game book and the sequels, which I don't think I'll be reviewing because I, I last read them so long ago, I would have to reread them before I review them. But, um, you know, there's, there's all this nuance in it. I was very surprised by the amount of, of emotional nuance to the characters in the book. Because I, I associate Dune... I, I used to associate Dune with, like, this sort of... Oh, it must be this very rational kind of... Um, you know, just this, this... I guess I had this straw man in my mind of, like, this... This hyper-competent... Like, competence pawn, right? Like, this really smart kid kind of just figuring stuff out and solving problems which there is quite a bit of and you know I think some criticisms that I've watched other videos have is that oh you know Paul Mordeep he's almost too perfect he 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 never really makes mistakes he's always kind of just 
knows the right thing to do, knows the right thing to say, and so in that regard, he's he is not very easy to relate to, I guess maybe, or he's he's just a little bit superhuman. And my understanding, so I haven't read the sequels yet, but my understanding is that um, part of what Herbert does is he sets Paul up to be a sort of messiah figure, and then he goes on to critique the the idea of having messiahs at all, and that you know, so. Even within this book itself, in the later chapters, in the later books, in like book two and book three, you see Paul have to grapple with things like, um, you know, so he, so Paul's an outsider, right? He's from, he's from another planet, and then he comes here, and on this planet, there are the Freemen, the Fremen, and they have, like, um, prophecies that some outsider would one day come and lead them in a, in a holy war. I, I might be fudging some of the specifics, but the point is, Paul realizes that he can kind of step into the prophecy. He can kind of step into their their myths and their ideas, and by doing so, he would earn their well. Earn is a is a you know it's a, it's a choice of word that may not be the right one, but he would gain their their unflinching, undying loyalty. And that, you know, even within the book, you can kind of see that there are hints that um, Paul doesn't think it's necessarily a good thing. It's like a thing that that seems necessary within the context that Paul is operating in to, to get what he wants. And so the kind of final outcomes that the Freeman one and Paul wants, I guess, is a flourishing Arrakis, like to have water and to have... Um, you know, uh, to have just to to transform the the desert planet into something more like Earth, right? Something more. Uh, and I'm not sure if Earth is in this book. I don't think so. But just uh, uh you know, the uh, Earth-like planet, which is which has resources and and that people don't have to to kind of um, squabble over and fight over. So so water is very very precious in Arrakis, and it's interesting to to experience how um, the the culture of the Freeman people is shaped by the scarcity of water so you know even when when somebody dies like they actually um, extract the water from the body and it's because they say that like the body belongs to the individual but the water belongs to the tribe and there's things like um, you know when when in in courtship like in in relationships in among the Fremen people, like uh, I guess when you're proposing marriage, you 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 give your your wife or your wife to be, um, like your water rings. Like it's it's just it's very it's very well thought out. Like clearly, Frank Herbert spent, you know, I'm guessing his lifetime, right? Like thinking about this and 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 constructing this this very coherent, cohesive world where people are making decisions and then going about their lives but with challenges and so on uh let's see what else i've said um yeah i I really appreciated how there's a lot of emotional nuance to the characters in the sense that the author very often has characters experiencing multiple emotions at once so you know like they 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 are afraid but they have to be brave or you know they are they are unhappy but they have to they're trying to hide it from each other and 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 there's like and you know there's there are layers to each character's utterances and you see other characters trying to varying to varying degrees of success trying to represent one state while feeling another it's kind of it's kind of a poker type game it's kind of a you know there's uh, there's layers of intrigue layers of of uh, well deception feels like too too negative of a word but it's like you just there's there's nuance right there's nuance to to the emotions that the characters are feeling and there's nuance to how other characters interpret those emotions and i found myself thinking huh like i was not expecting to get that from this book to this degree like it's it's a level of sensitivity that the author has and that the reader is invited to share in and i i really appreciated that another cool thing is that um so the the main character paul he has many names. So his his he is the son of the duke, and so his name is Paul Atreides. Atreides is the, the duke's name, and then you know he's also called Muad'Dib. That's the name he gets 
when he joins the Fremen. And, you know, the Muad'Dib is then called the Lisan al-Ga'ib, which is the, the kind of like the, prophet- the, the figure of the prophecy. And with his close friends amongst the Fremen, he, they call him Usu or Yusu, Usu. And the interesting thing about that is that, you know, there are all these different roles that this character inhabits. And I think at some point he says something like, um, you know, Usul would do this, but Muad'Dib would do that. Or, you know, the Lisan Al-Ga'id would do that. It's kind of, and it reminded me of how, you know, if you watch, let's say, the West Wing, like, so the, the president in the West Wing, his name is Josiah Bartlett, and his best friend is his chief of staff, Leo. And so Leo would sometimes call Bartlett, uh, sometimes he would call him Jet, like, hey Jet, what are you doing? And sometimes he would say, Mr. President. And, you know, each time he makes that choice, it's a very meaningful choice. He, he's deliberately choosing to to address the other person um, in a way that appeals to that part, that, that social role that they play. So there's a lot of nuance in... Similarly, in, in thinking about how Paul is wearing many hats and, and has many roles and has, has to do all of those things. Uh, what else? There's some... You know, there's, there's, some, there's like some fight scenes and there's some... Uh, like... There is... There's somebody... With, so in, in the, the first book, it's all about um, Paul, the Duke and his family. So Paul, his mom... And, and how they kind of um, are, are entering the new world of Arrakis and, and how they cope with that. And then there's, you know, there's like, um, there's loyalties and there's there's conflict and there's, um, you know, and I'm just opening to random pages now. Um, at some point, the Duke tells Paul uh, to hold Arrakis, one is faced with decisions that may cost one his self-respect. And, you know... So Paul swallowed in a dry throat. His father's words carried futility, sense of fatalism, and yeah, it's just it's it it's it it feels very real. It feels very um, honest, and it feels like like um, like I, I I feel gratitude. I think having read this, that. At, at being given the chance to witness so much thoughtfulness. And I feel this very strongly as well with uh, The Dispossessed by Ursula Le Guin, which I'll talk about in a separate video. But like, um, it's just really nice to inhabit this universe that has had so much thought put into it. And it's very refreshing. It's very... Well, okay, so I've been saying lots of nice things, right? Um, the thing is, the first few chapters of the book are pretty difficult to get into when you're starting out because... Uh, Herbert does not try to make it easy for you to understand what's going on. He just he just tells you what's happening, and there's a lot of words. You know, in the first chapter, it's like in the first page, it's like it was a warm night at Castle Caledon, the Atreides family departure to Arrakis, and then they're like, uh, you know, so it starts with Paul going through a sort of of um, test, and the, and she says, you know, if he's really the Quisat's Hederach. You know, it's and and the test is called the Gom Jaba, and like you're you're like what what are all these words? What are all these these ideas? It's so it's so much to take in. The Reverend Mother Gaius Helen Mohiam. It's like it's just so much, but it it takes like a hundred pages to go in and and to appreciate what's going on. I think this book really really rewards um, rereading. So I already can kind of think can sense that I am gonna enjoy rereading this book. Because there are things that, when you're reading it at the start, you don't know what to make sense of it. Like it's foreshadowing stuff, but you don't you don't yet know what it's foreshadowing. And by the time you get to it, you may not remember what the foreshadowing was because you know it's like it's any any ambitious work, right? Like there's so much going on, and it's everything's happening for a reason, but you don't understand yet. So it's a very um, it's not a f- super friendly book. It is it it was pretty easy to read, so you can keep turning the pages and keep kind of moving along and you might not be able to keep track of everything but um you know it's it's pretty it's pretty nice and uh the chapters often open with quotes from like i don't know like holy texts in the universe of the book or like you know like quotes from 
his histories and stuff like that and like the appendixes there's like this much of the book is 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 notes and appendixes and it's like you know about the ecology of the planet and it's it's just incredibly detailed which i i i kind of skimmed that when i got to that part because i was at that point i was i had already kind of enjoyed the book and i i wasn't looking to go in that deep i think if you read it kind of uh, slightly superficially you can still enjoy the the story of 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 you know a character going through life and making decisions and and having to make trade offs and stuff but um yeah i i'm not sure i would recommend it to everybody so it depends on what you're looking for so you know i came i came to this because i knew that it's it's a it's kind of a, a behemoth in in pop culture right like if you're into sci-fi people are going to talk about dune with some reverence even and they're just going to make references to it and it's nice that now i i'm now following the subreddit and i can i can i can laugh at the memes because i get what they are referencing so that's cool um if you just want something to read, I don't know if I would recommend this. It depends on what else you're you're interested in and and how much. There's a bit of work you have to put in to to get value out of the book. Like you have to, you do have to, to kind of dig into it. Um, but yeah, that's that's about it from me about Dune. I'm glad I read it. Um, I would recommend it. Uh, to and if if you've been thinking about reading Dune. And you haven't read Dune, you should probably read Dune. Like it's 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 it does not disappoint if you are going into it kind of um, with the similar expectations as me, which is like oh this is a classic and I would like to understand the classic, right? Um, yeah, it. I think it's aged pretty well. Like so, the books from like what the seventies when when exactly was it published? It was published in like I think nineteen seventy six. 1965 oh it's even older than i thought yeah so it was published the year singapore was independent lots of things happened in 1965 i'm gonna do a separate twitter thread about that but like um yeah it's it's interesting i think um there are some it raises some interesting questions about um what does it raise interesting questions about kind of kind of like um what what do you i mean so i think i i found myself kind of relating to paul a little bit in the sense of being an outsider who feels like he knows things so paul paul basically almost has like superpowers in terms of like foresight and 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 having a vision of of the future and and being able to persuade people of things and i i, I kind of relate a little bit like so that's that's kind of like exaggerated for for storytelling purposes right but i kind of relate a little bit to it in that i feel sometimes like as an outsider in the context that i operate in i i i, I kind of just feel like i i see further into the future than most people around me and i don't mean like i know what's going to happen but i mean i can i can consider what the outcomes may be and i can consider how things are going to change and and how things may happen and and just having a longer view and whether or not you should kind of step up into that role and of of being someone like so leadership i guess right like do you want to the if you can conceive of a future for a people and not just for yourself right but like for for your people like should you do it should you step into it and should you allow people to put their faith in you right um i think i share what i think is herbert's warning which is that you know uh you shouldn't try to you like messiahs are probably not good like and it's not because of the character defects of the messiah so like, the messiah can be a great person but just the the social dynamics of an of, of an individual and his flock right like of a, of a cult leader and his 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 underlings or whatever right they might do anything for you but like what you really want them to do is to bring their full selves to to the occasion and and i guess you know like um there are moments where you you can uh, reading the book and seeing the fremen through paul's eyes it's like they they want a holy war in a way right they want their lives to, to they want to sacrifice their lives in in service of something 
that they believe is of a greater meaning, which is in their case like to bring water to to Arrakis and and to, you know a a, a lush and 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 beautiful world for your descendants uh, for your for your people, right? Um, I th- I'm I feel like at the time Herbert wrote this, it might have been less conceivable, maybe that large groups of people might be be enlightened, right? Like they might like I I think there's this sense that there are. Uh, there are thoughtful people who try to be measured and and considered and try to to be fair, and then there are people who kind of go with the flow, like the the mob, I guess, or the just the masses. And it's it's challenging to talk about the reality of that without simultaneously coming across as kind of condescending towards people who are less thoughtful and who kind of just want, you know, like drama and, and bread and circuses, right? Um, yeah, so I don't think there are any answers, but I think um, it was a pleasure to inhabit that space and to consider the questions. And yeah, so you know, if you, if you like Dune, I would love to hear from you about what your favorite bits were and what what challenged you, what made you think, what um, what you like about it. And uh, yeah, that's all from me for my Dune review. Done.